The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. We're good. Okay. Hey guys, my name is uh, Chris Moore. I'm the founder of PCBSD, lead developer. This is what I do for my day job. And it's a lot of fun to hack on. There's a lot of neat things we can talk about. But today's talk is going to be a little bit more targeted. We're going to be talking about automating the deployment of FreeBSD and PCBSD systems. For those who don't know, PCBSD is just a desktop version of FreeBSD. They share the exact same base underneath, so it's all the same commands. Makes it easy to do things together between the two. But today, the problem we're specifically looking at, as someone here mentioned, you want to quickly deploy multiple FreeBSD or PCBSD systems. Maybe you really like this whole ZFS thing. And by the way, I want to mention, if you guys want to interrupt me or something, go right ahead. I love chasing rabbit trails. If there's something not clear up here, or you want to dig a little deeper, feel free to ask, and uh, we'll go ahead and do that. But uh, right now, if you want to deploy FreeBSD or PCBSD, there's really two ways to accomplish this. You know, the first solution is you're going to write your own installation scripts and configure everything by hand and then maintain it forever. The funny thing is I've given this talk at a number of conferences and usually there'll be like a couple BSD admins in the back, oh, we've been maintaining scripts for 10 years because we have to do this kind of install. And you know, there's just a number of people who do this because that's just how they get free BSD out there. Now, if you want to do this, that's great. Maybe you have a really unique installation, wonderful. Or you're a free BSD guy. You're one of these guys who, you know, hacks on the kernel on the weekend and you know all about disk partitioning and how ZFS like layouts and that just seems like fun to you, right? But if you don't want to do that, you know, manual disk partitioning may not be your thing. Maybe you're like me, you're lazy, you work for a living. The last thing you want to do is be sitting there reading a wiki page, trying to figure out how to align the partition so that the ZFS works properly, so you can get four K sectors, etc. And that's just not fun. So anyways, that's that's the first solution, and that's what people have been doing for years now. It's just not any good. So the second thing we came up with was solution number two. Use the PC Pin Client utility included with PCBSC and TrueOS. And again, I'll stop here really quick. So PCBSC again is the desktop version of FreeBSC. TrueOS is uh, something else that the PCBSC project puts out. It's uh, FreeBSC but with more utilities built into it. It's our version of FreeBSC with Bash and RSync and other Linux utilities. So I can go to a Linux admin and say, here, you want ZFS, you want FreeBSD, run this. This will make your life easier. You're not going to have to sit down at the shell and go, oh, I'm messing command. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to provide that out of the box for you. And then in addition, we include extra utilities like the fin client and the jail management utility we include in TrueOS that you won't have out of the uh, box on FreeBSD. So this is the solution we're going to be looking at today. Now again, you want to consider this, especially if you don't enjoy disk partitioning. If Gpart, head, cylinders, sectors, all that stuff scares you, as it does me, this is what you want to look at. And again, if you want to have a weekend, you don't want to worry about the build breaking Friday at 4 p.m., you know, this is the thing you want to look at doing. So what are you going to need to get started with this? Well, first of all, you'll need a system with a network interface, of course, uh, possibly two, as I'll get into in a moment why that may be advantageous. You'll need to be running PCBSD 9.1 or TrueOS 9.1 or later. This is when the utility was first introduced. And you'll need a few gigabytes of disk space, of course, for storing images, disk files, etc. So getting started. So after you've installed your system, we'll say it's on TrueOS. TrueOS is a command line console-based uh, operating system, no X included. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to extract the port tree. And I'm going to make a copy of these slides, by the way, available at the end. So if you need to grab these and look at the commands, don't worry about jotting them all down right now. They will be there for you. But uh, the first thing on FreeBSD you'll do is extract the port tree, which is our port make files. That's how we build applications from source, packages. There's 20 some odd thousand of them in there. So there's a lot of make files. And, and uh, this utility is going to make use of that at the moment. Now, if you're on PCBSD, say you decided to deploy this on a graphical system, control panel, system manager, task, fetch ports. I mean, there's a graphical way to do it as well, so you don't have to remember the command line uh, syntax. 
So after you've done that, again, one command, the next thing we're going to do is fire up a root prompt. There's no GUI for this. This is command line based. So we're just going to fire up a console or, or some X term or something and run the PC thin client command. The very first thing it's going to ask you is, are you sure you want to do this? Because you know, this is uh, going to make some changes to your base operating system. Of course, you'll abort here if you're just typing in your periods and not sure what it does. And then it's going to go ahead and prompt you what type of system are we setting up. An install server, which is mainly we're going to be talking about today, or a desktop thin client server. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, pause here for a second and just discuss what the other alternative is. So the remote desktop option, really quick, what does that do? Well, this utility can do two things. Again, install server we're talking about today, and remote desktop, that's more of a thin client server. So say you have a, a bunch of diskless clients, low-end systems that have been laying around in the, you know, the back shed forever, and you want to be able to set up a workstation or something where people can boot up off the network, get a hold of the web, email, et cetera, all graphically. This will set this up for you. It allows you to uh, basically boot up the system over Pixie over the network. It brings up a nice graphical login, and they log into whatever window manager you provide it. It could be KDE, LXDE, you know, take your pick. There's like 20 of them, I think, in PCBSD. Now, uh, why would you want to do this? Well, again, maybe you have a bunch of low-end clients, and you don't have the finances to go roll out you know, shiny new workstations for everyone, and you want to put that old hardware to use. Or, in some cases, you just want to simplify it. You want to be able to have one system where you can do all your backups on that system, you can do the security updates, do all the management, and not worry about you know, 30 clients out in the front office. It's one, one box makes that real easy to take care of that. And of course, you can go buy a nice, uh, heavier system and put cool stuff on there like ZFS and do redundancy and all that. But that would be a reason why you want to consider that. Now, you may not want to run this, of course, if you don't have a server with the horsepower. If you want to serve 30 clients and you're running on some old P4 with 512 megs of RAM and everyone fires up open office at once, it's not going to be a good user experience. I can tell you that. It's just not going to work out for you. Another reason you may not want to do this is if you need sound support. At the moment, we don't have any sound daemon set up for it, so your clients aren't going to be able to go and hit YouTube and watch videos and, and listen to music on Pandora. So that is a drawback. And that's something I want to add at some point, just time permitting, when I get a chance, that will eventually get put in. But at the moment, it's not there. So now we're going to get back to the actual installer. It's so cool. Hopefully it stays that way. Nice and bright. Okay, so at this point, we've gone ahead and picked the option I for an installation server. The next thing it's going to ask you is, what uh, network interface do you want to listen on for uh, DHCP? Now, in FreeBSD, first of all, are any of you guys FreeBSD users who has used it before here? You had a couple? Okay. So, in FreeBSD, our network interface is a little bit different. They will be named based by the driver name. So, you may have RE0 for real tech, EM0 will be another driver, etc. So, you'll need to figure out ahead of time which network interface you want to listen on. And in this case, I've picked EM0. Of course, once you set this, be careful what network interface, you know, cable you plug into which system because you're going to be booting up off the network at that point. After you've given it a network interface, that's pretty much it. At this point, it goes ahead and it sets up NFS for you for doing network mounting. It sets up some services in INET-D for sending uh, images over TFTP, and it sets up your DHCP server for you. These are all set up the same way if you were following a wiki article on how to do this on previous sites. So it's real easy after the fact to go in and say, hey, I want to tweak that or change it. There's no real magic to this. It's, it's pretty basic. It just does it all for you. And then it's going to tell you about a couple directories, and we'll get into that in a moment, what those directories do. But at this point, you're done. You've maybe spent three to four minutes tops deploying a Pixie system. It's ready to boot now. Plug the client in and go. And we'll show you what that looks like. Let's see here. So again, you may now connect the client system. All the services are started. Before you Pixie boot the client, though, you may need to check the BIOS on your client. Some of them require you to enable Pixie booting for them to work, select the network interface. And there's a number of NICs out there that don't have the Pixie boot ROM. So if you just can't find a way to boot it up off the network interface, that may be why you need to go buy like a PCI Intel NIC to throw in there that has Pixie support. But uh, that would probably be the only reason why it didn't work. So really quick, I'm going to break out of this and just show you because a demo is worth a thousand words, what this looks like. So, first of all, I'll just show you I have my host here running in this virtual box. This is just a true OS box I set up. It started all the servers, I just booted it up a second ago. 
I'm going to fire up the client now. Grab that back over for you guys. All right, so at this point, we're booting up off a fresh VM. We'll say there's nothing on the hard disk at this point. It's booting completely off the network. Um, it's going to show the PCB USB bootloader. Great. We can hit enter to bypass that. Okay. And we'll give it a second. For those who haven't seen before, this is what the free USB boot up process looks like. This is your kernel going through and setting up devices, DFS, etc. And we are just about done. Great. Okay, the client has booted. We've successfully booted from the network. We haven't touched anything on the disk yet. Now, the PC thin client sets you up with a couple dialog wizards that make it easy to install your clients. There's really only two options you care about here. The emergency shell first. If you have a system that won't boot or something's gone wrong, this is a great way to get in there and fix it with a shell without having to hunt down a DVD and, and do all that jazz to try and find a way to boot a non-booting system. But what we're looking at today really is the installation wizard. And once we bring that up, it's going to list any scripts I've provided to do the installation. We'll get into a moment here how we build these scripts and what they look like, what the syntax is. But really, on the client, all you're going to do is pick the script that you want to install. Confirm yes, and the installation is going. It's now running the installer onto the client, pulling all the files off the host. Um, what this uses is something called PC Sys install. It's the back end for the PCBSC installer, which supports ZFS and all the cool features of mirroring and encryption, you know, setting up users, packages, etc. So the second part of the talk, we're going to look at how you build those config scripts what the syntax looks like, what options and features, and kind of some power tweaks you can make to it. But uh, we'll just watch this here, because it takes about a minute to go through an entire installation of a FreeBSD server, is what I'm doing here. This is FreeBSD 9. We've already done all the disk partitioning. It's running ZFS, and it's just extracting uh, the image at this point. Any questions so far while it's doing that? Pretty self-explanatory? Cool. Oh, yes, Tom? So, uh, one of the things I found very hard with FreeBSD mm -hmm. um, was trying to make the software mirror of the root disks. Okay. Because that's something you could be, because ideally it would be automated, right? Because all yeah. the servers have to have. So, the question was software or root disks. It's been difficult on FreeBSD to do software mirroring of a root disk. Now, do you care if it's ZFS mirroring or any just GMIR? Or? Okay, whatever. So, PC Sys installs can actually do both. So we can do a G-mirror, which say you're setting up a UFS partition, you want to mirror it across two drives, great, we can do that. Not the recommended way I'd do it. I'd use ZFS and feed it the option, all the disks, and say I want to mirror this across three or four disks, however many you got, and it'll mirror root the whole thing. So you can actually go pull a drive out, reboot, and it'll come right back up. It's pretty cool. But I'll show you how we do that here in a second. It's pretty, pretty nifty. Okay, so at this point, the installation's finished. We are ready to reboot the client. So this will be the part where you unplug your network cable or go into your BIOS and tell it don't boot from Pixie anymore. But we're going to go ahead and let uh, VirtualBox boot back up. We don't want to wait for that. So maybe at this point you're 10 minutes into the process and you've already managed to set up your Pixie server and do an installation in this case. So again, big time saver because I'm lazy and I don't like writing these things by hand either. So I write tools to do this because I don't ever want to look at the code to do that again. But uh, yeah, there we go. We just brought up a FreeBSD box and that's running on ZFS. No muss, no fuss. Now how did we do all that magic though? Because you saw there were some scripts there. Let's see how we did that, right? So for that, we break out and we'll go back to the presentation. We'll about to dig in a little deeper here. Okay. So the first thing, customizing the install. I mean, naturally, you're not going to want to use my stock for EDSC image. You may have a custom version you want to use with special options and features and scripts and packages and tweaks that you, you know, developed for your own installation. So it's possible to set up this entirely on the server side, of course. It makes it very easy to get new systems set up. As it mentioned at the end of the installation, there's two key directories that really you have to pay attention to. On the uh, host, they're going to be mounted under home thin client install scripts and then install archive. And when your client boots up, that's where they get NFS mounted into the client system. And they're kind of self-explanatory. Install scripts is where we're going to put installation configuration scripts. And the archive is where you put your tarballs or your disk files or your DD images or whatever type of file you're using to do the installation. 
Now, when you install it, you're going to get a PC sysinstall.example file. So there's already something there that works out of box but for a standard UFS installation, which allows you just to kind of look at it and see what the syntax is without a lot of uh, research time. But for the first example, say I want to go change that to ZFS. Like UFS is neat, but that's old. I want to try ZFS now because that's new and cool, right? So let's take a look at what the syntax looks like. Um, if anybody here ever did the sysinstall installations with the old FreeBSD, the syntax is very similar. It's just a key and a value. So pretty easy to use. In this case, let me grab my label pointer so it'll be easier to do this. Okay, so right here, I have a disk block. I've set up UFS to say, I want to set up a root partition. This is in megabytes, I'm going to give it a thousand megabytes. Of course, swap, basically two gig, no mount point. And then everything else, the zero means is all the rest of my disk or partition we're going to set up for slash user, which is where most of your packages and data go, the FreeBSD. Now, if I want to convert that to ZFS, it's really just a one-liner. All I'm doing is changing the first disk partition to ZFS, I'm going to say zero because ZFS likes to use whole disks, so we're just going to feed it the whole disk or partition. And then I'm going to set up data set. So for those who don't know, in ZFS, once you set up your, your Z pool, your initial pool device, you can then create and remove data sets on the fly. So you can have a ton of data sets, and uh, adding a data set is really simple and cool, and you can add new flags to it and whatnot without having to go repartition the whole system. There's no more partitioning at this point. It's just ZFS, add data set, and done. But we want to do this from the installation. So I've created some of the basic data sets here, and then gone ahead and committed the disk label, and that's what the installer is going to do for me. Now, that's great. I converted to ZFS, but say I want to deploy my own 3DSE image. Well, at the top of the script, you'll have some information here like this. Install medium is saying we're installing from the local archive. In this case, it's the mounted host system. And it's under that slash install archive directory. We're telling it where the disk files are going to be located. And the type, in this case, is just a tarball. So you can give it a tarball. It can be any type. It can be gzip compressed, dzip compressed. Uh, XZ compressed is what we use by default because it's got better compression. But we can change this very easily. Again, local, so our archive is a tarball. But I've provided my own FreeBSD 8.4 tarball in this case. So it's easy to uh, package up your own systems, dump them into a tar file, boom, you're ready to deploy it. And if you have some particular needs, maybe you need to do a DD image instead. There's syntax for doing that, there's syntax for doing FreeBSD disk files pointed at the FreeBSD server and it will fetch them right off their site for you. So there's, there's a number of ways you can change this. Now, of course, you know, it's an installer. We need to be able to set up users, right? So user management, again, really simple. We're just going to set up a root password in this example. I'm going to add my user account. Um, if you're on FreeBSD or if you're new to FreeBSD, make sure you add one of your users to the wheel group. Otherwise, nobody has root access on the box, and that's no fun. FreeBSD does not allow root access via SSH, so if you're doing this on a remote system and you forget to set up a user with wheel, you're going to be like, great, nobody's got root on that box until somebody sits at the console and logs in. But something to keep in mind. Okay, so some advanced stuff. Now, say you have an image you deploy that needs to be customized for a client you're installing it on. Well, the PC sys install backend will, in addition, allow you to run scripts. So the first command we have is just called run command, and we're going to be running a script which is actually on the client. So this would be a script you shipped maybe, or a file or program you shipped in your install image. Great, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory. Maybe you have something which sets up Apache a certain way, or sets up some services a certain way you want to want to deploy quickly. Um, in addition, you can run scripts outside of the mounted file system for the client. Say you have a script you need to run outside that goes in and tweaks particular values that you do to do from the host. You can run that. The PC uh, BSC installer uses this to mount DevFS, so it's available on the client. I can go in and tweak some stuff that requires DevFS access. You know, there's a number of things you can do with that. Now, of course, packages. I mean, FreeBSD is great by itself, but when you have 20,000 packages, odds are you want a couple of them on your box. So uh, we did add support for packages in the PC sys install. Very simple to use. Just basically install packages, and then you just give it a list of space, uh, the limited uh, package names you want to install. So Apache 2.2, MySQL, pretty much anything you have a package for is ready to roll. You can use a short package name, or if you want to give it the full long version string, you can do that too, and it'll try to figure out what you want. 
Um, really cool feature with this, um, has anybody heard of PackageNG before? Is that new to you? All right, so FreeBSD came out with a new package format called PackageNG, and that's what they're kind of moving to, especially for 10. So the installer's already got support for it, and it'll detect what package you're trying to give it ahead of time. You don't have to give it any special options. The first package it hits, it'll detect if it's an NG package or the old style, and then do the setup for you accordingly. Package engine needs a little bit of, uh, of setup before you can start using it properly, so it'll bootstrap it for you. And of course, that's what I just mentioned here about package NG, and it'll bootstrap it. Now, FreeBSD disk files, say you don't have a single tarball, like we ship PCBSD with. FreeBSD breaks up their system into a couple of categories, base, documents, games, kernel, lib32 if you're on an AMD64 box. Changing to that's really simple. You can just change the path where they're gonna be mounted on the client, change it to the disk file format, and then list out the disk files you wanna use. That would allow you to just pull a stock FreeBSD right off their off the system if you've downloaded the disk files ahead of time. So of course, if you're gonna automate it, let's really automate it, right? One of the things uh, people asked for immediately was, hey, I wanna do unattended installation. Can we do that? Well, of course we can. So the way you can do it by default is you can create an unattended.cfg file. If that config exists, it's gonna boot up and give you a 30 second countdown. That's 30 seconds to Armageddon and your disk gets wiped and everything gets reinstalled. So of course, use it with extreme caution. Don't plug your boss's computer into the wrong network cable by mistake and then go to lunch, okay? Bad things happen. When it's done, it'll shut the system down, so it's powered off, and you're finished, ready to roll. If there's a problem, it'll obviously halt and hang and wait until somebody comes to take a look at it to see what went wrong. Again, use with caution. I make no responsibility for what happens there. Um, in addition to the unattended.cfg, you can remove that unattended name and replace it with a MAC address. So say you have a bunch of systems you know the MAC addresses to, and you want to provide different configs based on the MAC address of the server or whatever, you can do that, just MAC address.cfg. It'll detect the MAC of the client that booted up and go, oh, I have a match, let's use that install config. Uh, IX Systems, the company we work for, does a lot of servers. And we've talked about ways of tying that into like a web interface. Say a customer makes an order, we can do their configuration in a web interface which saves it based on MAC, because we know the MAC of the server we're gonna be selling. Boom, we're ready to deploy. The client, the, uh, the network tech just plugs it in, it installs and turns it off and we're, right, we're done and we're finished. So that can make it really easy to the deploy systems. Now, uh, scalability. All the CPU stuff's running on the client. Basically, your server is just a big, large file server. That's all it's doing. It's just serving files so you can network boot and serving files that we can install. So it's going to be pretty much just disk I.O. network speed dependent. But there's a few things you can do to speed that up. So first thing is the amount of clients we can have connected at a time. Right now, the default is 99 which it's just a DHCP client. So if you want to go tweak the network values and add more clients, feel free. You know, nothing's stopping you. The script doesn't care. If you want to hack away on that, go for it. So that would be the location where you do it. Now, if you want to speed up your installation, you can do some cool things like using ZFS mirror drives. So you're serving from three hard drives instead of one and getting more speed. You know, pop it on an SSD. You can even put your disk files in RAM on tempfs and you're serving out of memory and at that point, you know, the only uh, hitch is going to be your network connection. So it'll saturate your gigabit and go to town. So uh, there's different ways to speed this sucker up. Now another tip and trick. This is probably the coolest feature out of all of this. You know, I've showed you some scripts and we have a full wiki with details on that, but really that's still too complicated because I'm too lazy to remember all those commands. So what you want to use is the PCBSD disk, the same one we give out at the booth back there. They have a wonderful graphical installer on those, okay? And you're thinking graphical, what do I care about in the service, right? Well, the cool thing is every install you do with PC System Install is a fully 100% scripted installation, which means that GUI is just generating a script that we're going to use the installer on to install. So when you run that GUI, you can fire it up in a virtual box, you can simulate the number of disks you're going to be using on your, your client, whatever. Set it up graphically, I want ZFS with this options, this data sets, these options turned on in the data sets, I want these users added, etc. And when it's done, it's just going to save a copy of the script to the installed system. So again, you prototype your entire installation without ever touching a piece of text or a config file or anything, you've done it all graphically in a few minutes. Very simple, you didn't have to hit the wiki page for that. So that's, that's a pretty cool feature. That's probably one of the biggest selling points of it is, wow, I can, I can prototype everything in advance. Now what does that look like? So the graphical installer is really simple, 
and you can uh, go through, hit customize on the disk, change all your DSS options, it's pretty slick. And when you're done, we just added a new feature to the next uh, ISOs we're rolling out, where you don't even have to do the install anymore. You can just dump it to a USB stick when you're done. So you just pop in a uh, FAT32 formatted uh, USB stick, it'll copy that config off, and you can reboot your VM at that point, or your system, or whatever you're using. You now have a copy of that uh, installation configuration. And of course, it's going to have super nicknames. So if you have a stick with 20 of them on there, you can give them unique names like boss's computer, you know, secretary, front office, whatever. Okay, and same thing also with the graphical installer. We can load those configs from USB. So when you first boot it, it's going to ask you your language, but you get this nifty little button that says, "Hey, I've already, I've already set this up. I just want to load the config and go do the install." It'll let you do that as well, and you don't have to even go through the GUI again. Again, it's going to ask you for the same USB stick. So what's coming up? Well, first of all, we're still doing improvements to PC system install. I want to be adding some support for ARM here soon. There's going to be some new features. Uh, ZFS has a few more data set options I'd like to take advantage of. They're a little rare, but still be nice to have the support for them. Um, we're going to be changing the installation of the thin client where you don't even have to do the uh, port snap extract options anymore. It'll just fetch the packages right from a repo and go. And that'll cut the time down by another couple minutes. It should be, a, I'm hoping it's like a 30 second process to run the command, install, done. You know, you're done at that point. The only thing you have to know is what network interface you're going to boot from. I want to try and make it as, as simple and painless and fast as possible. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people 
uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this uh, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago. Uh, and, you know, it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, 
best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any asterisk or switch fox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astris, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.